It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this final talk in the 2024 Baltimore National Heritage Area It's More Than History Lecture Series. Today's online program is being recorded, and the recording and transcript of the discussion will be available after the program on our YouTube channel in about a week. If I could ask you, please keep your mics on mute until the end of the program when we will ask for questions. You can add those questions to the chat at any time and we will try to answer them during the chat session. We have an ASL interpreter through with us throughout the discussion in the chat, uh, Kira Colbert, as you can see. Thank you, Kira. Uh, you can also turn on closed captions in your Zoom toolbar. I'd like to add that accessibility is a core value at the Peel, so you will find that almost all of our programs are ASL interpreted and captioned, so please tell your friends. Our aim is to be accessible to all. The Peel's mission is about amplifying and sharing the voices and stories that too often have been overlooked or intentionally erased from the historical record. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Peel in Baltimore stands on the traditional ancestral lands of a number of indigenous peoples, including the Piscataway and the Susquehannock. Our work is ongoing to better understand the pre-colonial history of our city and region, and also to support the indigenous peoples who are part of our communities today. I'd like to thank Ryan Coons and the Maryland State Arts Council for the land acknowledgement references they've made available to us, and to local leaders like Ashley Minner Jones for ensuring that indigenous voices are heard and recognized in Baltimore today. You can pick up your free copy of the Illustrated Guide to East Baltimore's Historic American Indian Reservation walking tour map from the Peel, and also download the Guide to Indigenous Baltimore app for free. Now, if you're in Baltimore, we'd love to have you join us this evening for a roundtable discussion with the curators of the new Revolution in Our Lifetime exhibition about the history of the Black Panthers in Baltimore. That will start at about five o'clock. The roundtable won't start immediately, so if you can't make it there right for five on the dot, do come anyway. Um, tomorrow, there's a reception for Ed Istwan's new exhibition at the Peel called Flowers from 3 to 5 p.m., so you're welcome to join us for that as well. And you can find out more about these and all upcoming events at the Peel on our website, thepeel.org, where you can also sign up for our weekly newsletters. So we are so pleased um, that you are all able to join us um, today. And unfortunately, uh, the executive director of the Baltimore National Heritage Area um, was taken ill and um, so was not able to join us uh, to introduce our speaker. Um, so I am going to have that very great pleasure. Um, John Goldman is a curator at the B&O Railroad Museum, and you can check out his full bio uh, on the website at the link that's in the chat here. Um, John, can we have you come on camera? Hi. Actually, let me just check. Do I see, is Shantae back? No, okay. Unfortunately, she was at urgent care. Oh, there she is, yay! Hurrah, Shantae, you are such a trooper. Urgent care just before this session and she still made it. Okay, so Shantae, let me hand over to you. Well, I am just delighted that I pulled myself together to be here to introduce John. And I wanna thank John Goldman from the BNL Railroad. As everyone knows, um, Baltimore National Heritage Area is a partner and we work with so many wonderful museums and history um, storytellers that it was my pleasure to have John come on who is the BNO Railroad curator. Um, um, he'll be speaking to you today as you probably already read from the um, description of the program is about the revitalization and the uh, revolution of industry in Baltimore and how um, the train and the maritime have basically um, made um, Baltimore the center of um, our national history as far as the industrial revolution. So I wanted to do this story because it was important to let people know as we reinvent ourselves in Baltimore that this is a process that we always do. And Baltimore is always in the forefront of it. And John was absolutely the person to do that. 
um, because his experience, he has a BA in Asian Studies from Occidental College in Art Direction and Design for Social Impact from the Art Center College of Design. And he has an MA in exhib Exhibition Design from George Washington University. And he's taught at George Washington University and is currently an adjunct professor at Towson. So John has a uh, strong background in understanding um, history, storytelling, and how what we're talking about today is so important. So before I turn it over to John, I would like to announce that um, John may be a little bit confused this morning because he's uh, working under sleep deprivation. He has two baby twin girls that he's um, he has adopted. So um, we want to give John some space and grace as he goes through his presentation. So thank you so much, John. And now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shante. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I am running on a little sleep deprivation, but I am caffeinated. So I, th I think we're good. So let me just share my screen here. Um, I think, you know, in my bio there, I think the thing to think about is that the lens through which I look at history is through social impact and how we can um, amplify history, use history, tell stories in order to create positive social impact today in our communities, in our world. So that's the lens that I work through um, and where I'm coming from. And so I came to the BNO in 2019 and I've come to appreciate the BNO in a new way, uh, seeing its history, seeing how it reaches across the country and has impacted so much our history, I think it's important to recognize that this was the technological network of the 1800s. It was literally a new technology. It was literally a network and it transformed the way that commerce worked, people's sense of space, the standardization of time, the invention of electronic communications. So there's a lot of parallels with the internet and the computer revolution. So I would say that it was as impactful as the internet was in our lifetime. It was that sort of technological network of the 1800s. And therefore where our museum is, is kind of like the headquarters of Google. So maybe in a hundred years from now, the curator of the internet museum will sort of understand where I'm coming from because I think what we're trying to do here at the museum is tell the story of America over the last 200 years through the lens of the railroad, uh, rather than it just being a technological story about locomotives and freight cars. And in that way, we're able to really talk about so much more and, and really see uh, the impact the railroads had. So that's the lens through which I, I'm exploring BNO's history. And today we're gonna be specifically looking at Baltimore and, and its relationship to commerce here in the harbor. But um, if you zoom out a bit, the context of which is, is this giant impact it had across the country. So the BNO Railroad was chartered in 1827 and was founded right here where the museum is at our historic site. So 2027 is the 200th anniversary of the BNO. And as it was also America's first common carrier railroad, meaning it was the first public freight and passenger railroad um, in the country. And it's sort of the first example of what we think of as a railroad today. There were like private mining railroads, but um, this was the first real railroad company. So American railroading is turning 200 very soon. Um, and you're gonna see a lot from us on that in the coming months and years. Um, the BNO was founded primarily by Baltimore business leaders at the time, but it was actually one of the earliest examples of, of what we call a PPP today, a public private partnership, uh, where the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland, Maryland contributed a lot of the funds and sat on the board in the beginning. So it, it really was public and private. And um, today we're gonna explore, oh, and so why it's called the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad is not the state connecting to the state of Ohio, but rather connecting to the Ohio River. So the Ohio refers to the river and I'll explain why. So, sorry, let me minimize. So 
this map shows sort of the, the biggest cities around the year 1820 and major port cities. So you can see here um, the major ports at the time. And what's important to notice is that because of how the coast, um, it, it, when you go south, it actually goes west. Positioning Baltimore further west than Philadelphia and New York. And at this time, um, land travel of goods was really, really difficult. So um, the further west you got, the less land travel you had to cover for passengers or for freight. So that really positioned Baltimore as a really attractive port at this time um, because of the reduced land travel to get to the interior of the country. And you see highlighted here the major rivers in the Midwest because a lot of shipping took place down those rivers to get to the port of New Orleans, um, or it would ship as far east as you could over here to sort of where West Virginia is today to then do the land travel to the East Coast. And because of that, you know, Philadelphia and Baltimore at this time went back and forth buying for like second and third largest city in the country and really placed Baltimore as a very, very important economic center in the country. Um, so up until this point, um, I mentioned the land travel. So here, uh, this is a depiction of the National Road, which was America's first sort of federally funded highway. It went from Cumberland out west towards St. Louis. And then there was something called the Baltimore Pike, which was a toll road to connect to it from Baltimore. So a lot of goods before the railroad were transported. Here I have a 1800s truck, a wagon from our collection. So this is primarily how goods were coming to the Port of Baltimore um, up until the railroad. Uh, by the 1820s, um, cities on the East Coast started to build canals in order to improve the speed that, that goods could be transported to the East Coast. Uh, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, all started constructing these canals to go west. Um, the only problem, I, I have the star there at Baltimore, the problem for Baltimore is that a canal requires a river to follow and Baltimore does not have any westward uh, directed rivers. So Baltimore was unable to build a canal. And um, this started to really worry Baltimore business leaders um, at this point. So um, here we have, this is a painting that's actually in our museum right now. It's called the Founders of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And it's a fictitious painting of, of the most influential figures in, in the Bino's history in the first 50 years. Um, you might recognize some of the original board members here like Charles Carroll Carrollton, Johns Hopkins, William Patterson, Alexander Brown. These are names that we continue to see around town. They were already um, wealthy businessmen at this time. And um, as they feared getting cut out of the canal economy, uh, they actually met in the summer of 1826 um, and devised a plan to sort of not get cut out of this canal economy. Um, by this time, uh, word of the invention of rail the railroad in England had spread, and they actually sent over two engineers to England to figure out how this thing worked. And uh, of course, they didn't really have intellectual property laws like we do today. So basically, they wrote, figured out how it worked, brought it back, that knowledge back here, and they decided to create America's first railroad. And so by February of 1827, uh, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was chartered. In 1828, the BNO laid its first tracks and immigrant, immigrant labor was used for this project. Most of the workers were first generation Irishmen. And from the onset, the BNO's first president, Philip E. Thomas, who was a Quaker, banned the use of enslaved labor on the BNO and by its subcontractors. So during the time of increased discrimination, the BNO offered some of the best employment opportunities for these um, Irish immigrants. And so then it's no wonder why this neighborhood here surrounding the museum is where so many Irish families settled. 
Um, the first rail line, which opened in 1830, connected Ellicott's Mills, which now we know as Ellicott City, with Baltimore. It was called Mills because the river there was used to power the mills that produced flour. And so trains at that at this time traveled at a whopping 13 miles per hour. So the 13 mile trip took one hour, which seemed astonishingly fast at the time. The tracks continued to spread west across Maryland until it hit Harper's Ferry and crossed the Potomac River for the first time in 1834. In 1835, construction of a second line split from the main line in Relay, Maryland to go to Washington, DC. And for a long time, the B&O served as the only rail link between DC and Baltimore. Also, side note, uh, Relay is called Relay because it was the junction point at which the B&O had a Relay house that regulated the traffic um, at this point where the railroad split. In 1829, the B&O opened the Mount Clare Shops, which uh, is the, our current property at the B&O Railroad. Um, over its long history, countless Baltimoreans have found gainful employment at the shops and on the railroad. The shops at this time were a one-stop shop for everything. At its height, it was 100 acres. Um, if you know the Mount Clare Shopping Center, included all that land and uh, some of Pigtown. Um, and it had a freight yard, it had a passenger station, and had everything else needed to operate the railroads. So from building bridges and tracks to meal prep, it all happened here at one spot. And so because of all this infrastructure from the B&O, essentially Baltimore was for a time to the rail industry as what we think of Detroit now for the car industry. So I'm gonna get a little deeper into freight here. Um, in 1830, as I said, the B&O opened the line to Ellicott's Mills and flour was carried from the mill to the harbor where it could be loaded onto freight ships. While the B&O ultimately hoped to send goods westward, this was a really great start, and Baltimore merchants were immediately benefiting from the influx of flour. In the 1830s to 1850s, the B&O expanded west through the coal country. The U.S. has so much coal, and some people even call the United States the Saudi Arabia of coal because uh, of how much we have here, especially in the Appalachian Mountains. And with increased access, ease, and speed of transport, the coal industry not only powered the steam locomotives, but became a critical expert export for the country and for Baltimore. In 1853, the B&O reached Wheeling, West Virginia, which was then a part of West Virginia. Um, and uh, that's when it reached, finally reached the Ohio River, living up to its namesake mission. Um, and by connecting to the river, they could then continue to ship freight um, and passengers using the whole entire river network um, which really just opened up the whole Midwest to the Baltimore port at that point. Um, the B&O continued transporting heaps of coal from the mountains to the B&O coal piers here in Baltimore. Some of the coal was used to fuel Baltimore's own growth and industrialization, and some of the coal was also sold to other cities in the U.S. But perhaps most importantly, a, a lot of this coal was sent to Europe and particularly in England to fuel industrialization in Europe. Through the sale of coal, Baltimore established itself as an assen absolutely essential trade city, one that could easily rival the other East Coast ports. If we drill down to the city of Baltimore, here we have a map from 1848. You can see over here where the museum is today, Mount Clare Shops. Um, the B&O began constructing track down the streets of Baltimore down Pratt Street all the way across the harbor. Um, and they used this to connect to the industries and the piers um, around the harbor so that um, these different companies could directly load and unload goods onto the B&O network. Um, these coal-driven locomotives proved not only to be an environmental hazard in the city, but also a pedestrian safety hazard, as you can imagine, a giant locomotive going down the street, down Pratt Street. So Baltimore City um, soon outlawed locomotives on the street of Baltimore City, and instead they used horses. So there was a big horse stable here, and horses were used to do this sort of last mile or so of um, connectivity. And then the goods would be brought and loaded onto the trains at Mount Clare. 
Um, fun fact, the end of our parking lot, which is right around here, that used to be the city line and the county line. So at that time, the locomotives were allowed up until the edge of our property here. Um, to the south, the same thing was happening as the B&O began purchasing the waterfront in Locust Point and creating its own ship docks and building facilities to facilitate the export and import of goods. And, the, and so this is um, a very early map, but um, it continues to grow in the, and the B&O continues to gobble up a lot of the waterfront property um, and other property in Locust Point as time goes on. This is a 1948 railroad map of the city. And so the blue here is B&O lines. And you can see it goes down Pratt here to connect to the Pennsylvania Railroad over here. Um, we have Howard Street Tunnel already built, which arches around the city and continues east and north. But over here, just look at Locust Point. This is all the rail infrastructure. So this whole waterfront was basically B&O piers operated B&O you know, ships sometimes even coming through. And then to the south, we get Curtis Bay, the, the coal piers over here. Um, and then interestingly, they, they had track in Fell Street um, and they would have barges that actually carried train cars across the harbor to then get loaded onto trains again and continue along the way, particularly before Howard Street Tunnel was built. Um, so this is just some images from Locust Point, and you can really see the amount of infrastructure that they had there. I love this shot here with Fort McHenry. All of this was BNO, and you can see how much track is there, and and CSX is still running a lot of this. Uh, a lot of that infrastructure is still there today. All right. Let me jump so this is kind of a case study on just one thing, but it was around the time of the Civil War that bananas began gaining fame in the U.S. And for many years, they were considered a very exotic fruit, only eaten by sailors traveling back from the Caribbean. Due to a lack of refrigeration, ripe bananas rarely made it all the way to Baltimore. But with the invention of the railroad and refrigerator cars, that all changed. The first company to begin importing bananas to the U.S. was the Boston Fruit Company, later known as the United Fruit Company and today Chiquita. Um, technological advancements in transportation like the steamship allowed the, for bananas to reach the US faster. The first ships would arrive in New Orleans uh, because it was the closest port to Central America. But once refrigerated steamships are invented, bananas travel all the way to Baltimore. Refrigerated rail cars were invented in the late 1800s and were widely in use by the 1900s. These cars were essentially insulated ice boxes. We have an example here on the right that you can actually go inside of here at the museum. The b &O Railroad even built their own fruit pier in 1957 in the Baltimore Harbor. By the mid 1900s, ships full of bananas would arrive in Baltimore every Monday and Thursday. Once the ship docked, b &O employees known as banana sorters would transport large bunches of bananas to a nearby refrigerated train cars. So many bananas came into Baltimore that there was a train called the Banana Special that would depart eight at 8, 8 p.m. with 25 train cars full of bananas. The largest ships carrying these bananas into Baltimore in the 1950s would require close to 200 refrigerated cars carrying 2,400 tons of bananas. In the 20th century, the exotic banana went from a rare treat to the most eaten fruit in America, with the B&O and Baltimore's Harbor playing a major role in that. So I spent a lot of time on these bananas, but I just wanted you to consider that if this is just one example of the history of the banana, you can multiply this effect by all the commerce that's coming through the Port of Baltimore and how influential uh, the relationship between the shipping and the railroad was to connect the whole country. Um, I made this little timeline here. This is eastbound freight uh, arriving to Baltimore. So in 1836, we have 5,600 tons of goods total. And you can see across time all the way to 1899, by then we have 25 million tons. So coal was a major, major um, uh, commodity here and flour and livestock were other big ones too. And you can just see this exponential growth across that time period. And so imagine how much more commerce the Baltimore Harbor was able to do with this influx 
of goods. And just a little side note, yes, Pigtown is called Pigtown because this is that's where the uh, livestock was processed and butchered once it arrived from the B&O um, into the city. Um, I did a lot of talking about freight, and that's sort of the big story with the commerce and the harbor, but there is a B&O story in terms of immigration that I just want to shed a little light on. The B&O Railroad both shipped freight and transported passengers. They were both important services of the B&O. And so um, in 1867, the B&O and the North German Lloyd Company made a deal, and the B&O would open an immigration pier at Locust Point. And uh, they agreed to send at least one immigrant ship per month. The next year, the Locust Point Immigration Pier was opened to great fanfare. Germans and Irish immigrants were among the largest groups to use the pier until 1890. In 1887, the BNO built an immigration station at Locust Point. So that the immigration point here was built and operated by the BNO in the beginning. The station was leased to the federal government later and used to inspect and clear immigrants. By 1890, there were more Eastern Europeans coming through Locust Point than Germans and Irish. One million people, about 20,000 per year, entered the United States through Locust Point between 1867 and 1914. Several ethnic and religious groups passed through uh, this port of entry, including Germans, Irish, Jews, Poles, Lithuanians, Czechs, Italians, and Greeks. The historic pier was destroyed in a fire in 1917. Um, there's a story that I'm hoping to explore later if I have time, but um, there's an idea that perhaps the Jewish migration to the Midwest can be traced through the BNO because between World War I and World War II, you could actually purchase a single ticket from Europe to the interior of the United States as one ticket. So you you could buy a BNO ticket from Europe to you know, and at that time, people when people wanted to come here, maybe they're buying a ticket to Detroit. They don't know what Detroit is, but uh, you would get on the ship, arrive here at the port, and 20 minutes later, be on a train headed to the Midwest. So it wasn't like you bought your ticket to Baltimore and then you bought your ticket ongoing. So that could explain some of the migration patterns, perhaps to the Midwest through Baltimore. Um, you know, I, going back to the beginning of, of my talk, I think it's it's important to recognize that sort of as this technological network, um, Baltimore was really a technological innovation hub at the in, in the early days of, of railroading. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the innovations that are really a part of the Baltimore Harbor story. So uh, first Samuel Morris and the tele telegraph um, in 1844, Samuel Morris sent the first successful telegraph message from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore along the B&O's lines. The B&O had an interest in coordinating trains and avoiding collisions and so supported Morris's work, allowing him to build cables from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore along the B&O track right of way. B&O engineers also contributed to this technological feat by working on the receiving equipment here in Baltimore. And they did most of that work at a station that used to um, exist um, at the corner of Charles, I believe, and Pratt Street, right by the harbor there. There used to be a little B&O station to coordinate uh, the freight going over there. Uh, so, you know, electronic communications really started here in Baltimore, right there at the harbor. Um, the first message, this first electronic message in the world uh, said, what hath God wrought, and was sent by Morse from the Supreme Court ch chambers of the U.S. Capitol building along the B&O tracks and received uh, the first one right here at our museum in the passenger station, um, which you're welcome to come see. It should go without saying that this invention, an instantaneous means of long-distance communication, would go on to revolutionize business and industry and to spark a thriving telecommunications industry. The BNO became early adopters of this technology and other railroads quickly embraced it too. In fact, many recognizable 21st century telecom companies have roots in the railroad's telegram services. Western Union acquired the BNO's lines, while SPRINT is actually an acronym that stands for Southern Pacific Railroad Internal Networking Telephony. 
Another maybe less known interesting fact is that in 1880, following the Baltimore Railroad riots uh, that responded to the extremely dangerous nature of working on the railroad, the b &O Railroad established the Employees Relief Department. The department offered compensation for death and injuries, the first true benefits package for railroad employees. So just like today, you could buy into this program offered by the company. This program became a precursor to work benefits like employer provided health care. After the railroad, uh, one of the biggest American industries began this practice, other industries followed suit. It is difficult to say that uh, say what workers' rights would have looked like without the impact of this happening at the BNO. Today, our museum is working to digitize and better understand. Oh, I didn't, sorry. We have all these medical records in a collection here, which consists of about 16 million documents, because um, at this time, the BNO also provided the doctors. So we have all the medical records for a big chunk of this history. And they might prove to be one of the earliest medical record collections in the country. In 1895, the BNO electrified the Howard Street Tunnel, the first electrified mainline track in the world. Uh, in, in the world. And so why did they do this? Because if you can imagine a steam locomotive going through a long tunnel, it's producing a lot of toxic fumes and it, it could actually kill the train crew and uh, passengers going through the tunnel. So steam locomotives would come to the big edge of the tunnel, power down, and an electric locomotive would attach to the train and pull it through the tunnel. And once through, the steam locomotive would start up again and continue on its way. Um, the success of this electrification later inspired New York's Grand Central Station to also electrify in 1913 for that uh, long tunnel leading into Manhattan. In the early 20th century, the B&O began using electric locomotives to carry goods around Fells Point and later in Locust Point. Up until this time, steam engines were outlawed from operating in the city, as I said, um, but electric locomotives being considered cleaner were thus permitted on the harbor. This route revolutionized the way freight was moved across Baltimore City. Um, at, at this time, these electric locomotives worked um, similar similarly to the streetcars with an overhead power line, but um, fully electric locomotives were not really able to be implemented on the railroads, the larger railroads, because if you imagine you have one single electrical line going across the country, it goes down in the middle of nowhere and your whole system is like out of electricity. It just wasn't feasible at that time. Um, but this early invention of electric motors later led to the development of um, diesel electric locomotives, which are the contemporary gas powered locomotives we're used to seeing today. But of course, electric mo locomotives are having a comeback as we try to go more environmentally friendly. Um, the full scope, here we have a map of the BNO at its height. Um, you can see it goes from New York all the way to St. Louis and Chicago. Um, in and, and just imagine the connectivity this gave Baltimore with Baltimore sort of being the headquarters of it. It really did rival the other railroad companies of the time, and it really had an, an enormous reach across the country. Um, in 1973, the BNO was merged with the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad to form what was called the Chessy System. And in 1980, the Chessy System merged with the Seaboard Railroad, which primarily operated in the southern part of the East Coast. The Chessy becomes the C in CSX, while the seaboard became the S in CSX. And in true 1980s branding fashion, the X um, in CSX is said to symbolize the C and the S working even better together than apart. Today, CSX owns and operates the right of way that the BO tracks um, were built on and uh, they, throughout the whole historic network and through our city. And then to bring back to our region, um, I added this red dash line here, but the current um, Mark train, the, the Camden line and the New Brunswick line, they're actually the historic b &O, um, right away where the, um, that the b &O built. And CSX owns it and Mark leases it, but um, it's actually the exact same geographic space 
that the B&O lines were on. And then um, it, it doesn't exist anymore, but there used to be a westward direct line from Baltimore straight out west, which connected right around Point of Rocks over here. Um, so that's all I have for you. I encourage everybody to visit the B&O Railroad Museum. We have lots of different histories we're exploring. We're really delving into black history to the, uh, we have a new exhibit um, on the relationship between the railroad and the Underground Railroad um, after our designation as a National Underground Railroad site for the freedom seekers that um, traveled through our site. We're exploring um, art history, we're exploring technology. So I think there's a little bit of something for everybody and I hope you enjoyed this. So I am available for questions. Anybody has some. Thank you so much, John. That was fantastic. Um, I am going to step back in because unfortunately, Shantae is really not feeling well, um, but we really appreciate her um, popping in at least to introduce you because this series and Baltimore National Heritage Area's um, support of these telling these kinds of stories and um, really showcasing these histories has really been invaluable. Um, so we're very grateful to you for joining us today as well. We've had a few questions. Um, so let me uh, see if I can kick off. There were uh, a couple in the chat. Um, I think you answered the one about what kinds of goods were transported. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit more about the, the danger of the immigrant labor that was undertaken with the railroads? Sure. Um, yeah, in the early days, building the railroad was a monumental, grueling um, experience. Everything was handmade, right? So um, it, you know, it also depended on the geography and climate of where it was being built. But you know, the land had to be cleared, leveled, um, the track brought in and installed by hand. So they had these like giant tongs that they would carry around. 300 pound segments of track um, and then hand nailed with, you know, the spiked into the ground. So um, it was, it was um, physically grueling. Right. And so a lot of, particularly in the South from South of the Potomac river, a lot of that was built using enslaved labor. And then here in the North, it was most commonly uh, new, new migrants who were doing this work. And then of course, in the West, we've heard about, the Asian uh, migrants, the Chinese building, the transcontinental. So there's, it, it's a, it was a not great job. So that's that's the kind of labor that was done. Um, you know, there are stories of of the Irish workers camping out in Patapsco Valley because it got too hot in the summer here, and and they were working on, for instance, building Thomas Viaduct over there and other places. So, uh, you know, there might be like camps traveling down the track. Mm -hmm. Uh, and people living away from home to do that work. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the, uh, I guess the most best known to me anyway, um, labor for building railroads is, as you said, Asian um, immigrants um, in the West. And I, I think I know that um, Baltimore was the first place that Southeast Asians and Chinese people immigrated to this country, but but they were not part of that workforce at this no. end of the railroad line. To be honest, that was later, and and so uh, in the twenties, thirties, forties, it was mostly European migrants still. Got it. Got it. Well, um, can we maybe go back to the beginning a little bit and hear more about what appealed to you about this topic? Why have you made this a focus of your research? I mean, I think there's two points. Like, one is I think it's important to see the role of Baltimore and its connectivity to everything else. It's it, you know, it's not really about the harbor. It's it's about the harbor was the focal point of a global net commerce network, and and it took a whole lot of infrastructure to make that happen. And the railroad really accelerated that. It, it, you know, going from the dirt road with horses to a railroad was just, you know, that's why I showed that table. It was just exponential growth. And Baltimore was really an economic center in the, in that time period in the 1800s. 
And I think sometimes maybe we forget how important Baltimore was um, in the 1800s on a national stage and, and for the economics of this country. Um, and, that, and then there's this sort of, the more I learn everywhere I go in Baltimore, I see the BNL. It's it's everywhere, and it's like it's like a it's like it's like a web that spread across the con the city, and I still see it everywhere I go. Um, buildings, people's names who helped found it, and the wealth they generate. You know, Johns Hopkins. People think he founded it with money he left in his will, but in fact, he left no money to create the university or the hospital. What he did was he left all of his BNO stock to form those, and the money stayed in the family. So. That's how much wealth he generated out of um, the BNO and being a founding shareholder. Um, so we say, you know, Hopkins was founded on the BNO stock. Interesting. I um, listened recently to a podcast uh, recorded some years ago, actually, by Matt Crinson, um, who wrote the book Baltimore Political History. And he did a wonderful one on. Um, how the city had to kind of bail out the BNO and and prop up its stock because it was so deeply invested it was kind of too big to fail yeah. uh, it would have taken it, the whole it was the car industry you know there's a lot of similarities with the car industry or with tech you know um it, it yeah yeah fascinating but was there anything in your research that really surprised you you know I mean, I love the banana story. I think that was what, yeah, we we use it to teach elementary middle school kids a lot here, but I think it's to think that it went from this exotic fruit to the most eaten fruit in the United States is, and, and that that happened here in Baltimore because of a port, a pier, uh, like processing facility for the fruit just shows like what this capacity building, what this infrastructure did and can do. And then it's ripple effect across the country, right? So I think things like that and just seeing um, how interconnected it is. Yeah, and the power of um, supply chains, which we all experienced firsthand during the pandemic, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I heard uh, a U.S. economist interviewed recently about that, about the pandemic. And he said, you know, frankly, it really took us all by surprise. Like, they're economists, like, this is their work. and. Even so, uh, the impact of those supply chains, both when they're disrupted or when they're in place, is is astonishing. Well, and we're probably about to feel that again with the bridge collapse, and and you know we're talking about it in terms of the ships, but we're thinking about it in terms of you know CSX's con connectivity to freight and and how that how the the rail freight is gonna it's gonna go you know is totally impacted by this too. It's not just the ships, it's the whole connectivity to the supply chain, right? Yeah, that's a great point. And um, all the commerce deflected to other cities until then, right? Right. Yeah, so that's kind of answering another question that um, actually Shantae had for mm -hmm. you. About why do you think this history is still relevant? Is there anything else you want to add on to that? I think going back to my mantra about the internet, I think I think it's it's important because it's 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 more than infrastructure, it's more than commerce. It really changed how we work as a society. Imagine going from the human speed limit of which was a horse up until 18 the 1820s, you know, which was about 7 or 9 miles per hour to then be able 30 years later to go 35 miles per hour just how the world shrank in, in a way that we all feel connected with the internet. I think that started to happen then. And um, then think about labor rights and unionization and black history and, and uh, medical history. And it, you know, it's, it, it balloons out into this sort of um, window into sort of the last 200 years of history. Right. Yeah, and you brought up um, uh, Samuel Morse. Um, so I know he was a painter as well as in, involved in uh, new technologies. Um, how involved was he with the city of Baltimore? Is, is that Has that come up in your research at all? You know, I, I'm not, I don't know. I, you know, I, the reason that that took place between DC and Baltimore was because of the BNO. And so he, 
he was up here a lot and communicating a lot with folks here in Baltimore to coordinate um, the telegraph. Um, from a technological standpoint, from a press standpoint, they had the big press event in that station I mentioned on Charles on Pratt Street. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, at that time, Baltimore was like this major city, sort of closest to DC too. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that really can't be um, emphasized enough. Um, it's uh, so I, I did my graduate, my doctoral work in American art history. And one of the names that you know if you study American art is the Peel family. But they were always associated in my training with Philadelphia. So when I came to Baltimore, and discovered that they'd founded the museum you see behind me, the first museum ever built in the Americas, I was really surprised that I hadn't known about the Baltimore connection. And now that I've dug into it, I realized that actually Rembrandt Peel, this was his third attempt to start a museum in Baltimore. And his dad had had, you know, the family had been running a museum in Philadelphia for decades. And he kept coming back until he succeeded. And you think, why was it so important to be in Baltimore? And I think it's precisely as you say, it was the place to be. It was in a housing boom throughout the first half of the 19th century. And um, just everything seemed to come through Baltimore. And I guess it's largely because of the railroad. Uh, I mean, later after Rembrandt Peel's day, but. Yeah, well, it was all because of its it was so westward with the Chesapeake Bay, it was already a really appealing port, right? And then you add the railroad to it and it just kept that going and, and to the point where the canal stopped getting built because the railroad was so effective, right? Mm -hmm. So it, there's a legacy before the railroad and into the railroad, mm -hmm. placing Baltimore as an ideal location. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing that's um, certainly helped our research is that so many records now are digitized online, but it sounds like you've got an awful lot that still need to be digitized. You want to you talk? I have no about idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, we inherited a lot of the original b &O's sort of office documents, which you can imagine. Is, in fact, it was the whole top floor of the Camden warehouse was essentially like old records that we inherited a lot of when the sports authority or yeah. when the when the Camden Yards was built as a stadium. Because uh, that that building that that Camden Yards is on is the old freight warehouse of the BNO. And Camden Station was built by the BNO there. So and was headquarters for a time over there. Um yeah, we, you know, <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to wrap our minds around what we have so that the those relief records is just one collection that we have. Uh, we also have every accident report uh, of locomotives or train accidents that ever took place on the BNO that are sort of waiting for some love. So uh, we have the entire photography collection of the BNO's press department. So we have hundreds of thousands of photos of everything you can imagine. So a lot of people actually don't know that about us. We have a huge archives. We have employment records. So actually one of our most requested um, sort of archival research question is genealogy, people looking for their ancestors who worked on the p &O. Um, But, um, you know, we do free research requests here at the museum. We do our best to answer it. It's free if it takes an hour or less of work. Um, so, yeah, that's on our website if anybody has oh, a that's amazing. Yeah. And, and can people come to the museum and do their own research in your archives as well? Yeah. Uh, yes, by appointment. Uh, we ask that we, you contact us first if you want to do direct research. We get a lot of researchers who come in, um, but we like to pull everything ahead of time that you might need. Got it. Got it. All right. So and we, yeah. and we have a huge artifact collection, which I think people don't recognize. And I'm working to try to get more out there, but we probably have like around 30,000 railroad artifacts uh -huh. on just the locomotives and train cars. Um pocket watches, lanterns, silverware, Pullman Porter, uniforms, all kinds of stuff, model trains. So um, we have a vast collection here and we have 42 acres here in West Baltimore. And can people also use the grounds like a park? Um, you know, when you buy a ticket to our museum, 
you have access to um, nine acres of public space across multiple buildings. Um, and then we have our train ride, which goes down the first mile of track in the United States. It goes almost all the way to 95 um, through West Baltimore. And then um, we actually have a collection of equipment in our parking lot, which is free of charge. You can just come and look around there. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, it's, it, sorry to interrupt you, but I, it's interesting you say park because one of my first instincts here was to think about our space, not as like a museum per se, but as a historic site and a park almost. So we've been, to, it, it, there's so much to see, so much history to uncover that you can't do it all in one trip. So we've been developing these sort of self-guided trails where you can learn different histories by going through the museum in different ways and making different stops. So we almost have like a trail men mentality to viewing our site. Yeah, I've ridden that mile of track several times with my kids and mm -hmm. enjoyed the facilities that you have there for the kids. Is the Lego back, I have to ask? What Lego? There used to be a lot of Lego. And then I think it got taken away during the pandemic. Um, we have Lego workshops for, <laughs> for students. <laughs> and actually, sneak peek, we might be doing a Lego summer series, but I, I think we're trying to bring Legos back. Yeah. Oh, exciting. Okay, so let me go back to those artifacts, though, that you mentioned, because I think that also might be uh, surprising information for the history buffs and researchers in particular um, watching this. So tell us more about the, the 30,000 artifacts and what you would consider some of the key artifacts to look at if you want to understand this history a little bit better. Well, I will make a plug. We've been working hard to start digitizing and putting stuff online. So we do have a searchable database now. Um, for the public, we have, I think, about 5,000 things up, which we've done in the last year. So we're, we're going to be putting more and more out there. Um, I You know, it really depends what lens you're looking through. And what I always say is, if, you, if, you, if you're looking for something, tell us what you're looking for, because chances are we might have it. It's, it's sort of that diverse. So like, for instance, um, we have John Work Garrett's will. John Ward Garrett was the Garrett family, which we may have heard about here in Baltimore. He was the president of the BNO through the Civil War and was Lincoln's advisor for the railroad um, during the Civil War, which was the first war to ever use trains. Um, and his daughter, uh, Mary Garrett, became a really big uh, feminist here in the city, got Johns Hopkins Medical School to open up to women. Uh, that ha they have properties all around, right? Like Hopkins. Um, so we have his will, which sheds a lot of light actually on how he treated his daughter and uplifted his daughter, how he bequeathed stuff to her. Uh, unusual for the time, like he made sure that no man would be factored into her receiving her inheritance. So interesting stuff like that. Um, we have a mechanical pencil that was from Lincoln that was given to John Work Garrett, which was high technology at the time, a mechanical pencil on a gold chain, like a pocket watch. Mm -hmm. um, we have rail segments throughout time. So you can see the development of the technology. Um, of course we have like 200 locomotives and rail cars. So, yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned Garrett. Um, Nick, who was very pleased to learn that beer was the cause of refrigerated, uh, the, the driver for refrigeration and, and rail service, um, wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about Latrobe and Garrett. Um, well, Latrobe, the whole family was <laughs> involved, which Latrobe? Uh, we have Latrobe, the architect of the Capitol building, his son, um, who bear the same name, was um, an engineer for the BNO and later became chief engineer of the BNO. He designed the bridges um, as you leave our property here. So Thomas Viaduct, um, and I'm giving a talk on this tomorrow at Patapsco Valley State Park, if you're available. Um, he designed that and became the chief engineer for the BNO. And his son later also became the engineer for the BNO. So the the and then um, they were also involved in the original scouting for the route, the surveying of the land to figure out where to put the tracks down. So the Lo Latrobe family were were 
directly involved in the very early engineering feats of the B&O. Um, and then if Garrett was just recognized as like one of the most influential presidents of the B&O due to his role um, supporting Lincoln's war effort because the B&O was essentially built along the Potomac River. It really was the front of Union territory. So, um, yeah. So Nick chimed in, uh, same family town where Rolling Rock beer was made. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that and Natty Bo were mainstays when mm -hmm. I was. <laughs> um, so, so just to get this straight, so there's Latrobe, the architect of the U.S. Capitol, and many buildings actually throughout Baltimore, I believe. Um, and the Basilica. Then, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a spring house up at the BMA, and I'm sure there's much more that I'm not aware of. Then he had son engineer, grandson engineer. Wasn't there also a mayor named Latrobe? Is that the same family, mayor of Baltimore? I don't know. Maybe somebody knows in the <laughs> comments. <laughs> not, not railroad related. Um, I'm sure there's somebody uh, in this session who can answer that question. Um all right, fantastic. Well, we're we're coming up to the top of the hour. Any last questions um, from our our participants here? As you heard, um, John is speaking tomorrow. John, do you have a link, or can you tell us some info about where to find out more about that? I'm not, uh, you know, I wasn't in, involved in the marketing. It, it's <laughs> eleven. I believe it's eleven a.m. Patapsco Valley Park. Um, the Thomas Viaduct there was designated a national engineering landmark. And so there's an inauguration of the um, plaque commemorating that new designation. All right. Fantastic. Well, maybe my colleagues can quickly find something and post it in the chat here today. I will say the BNO and the history of railroads in general um, has a special place in our heart um, at the Peel because the uh, chair of our board, who was really responsible for keeping the campaign to save the Peel going for more than 20 years after it was shuttered, um, was Jim Diltz, um, who wrote several books about the history of the railroad. And I think his final book um, uh, was honored with a, a book launch at the BNO Railroad Museum shortly after he passed. So thank you so much for carrying on that really important tradition. Um, for the city and, and for the country. And, um, oh, let's see, hang on. There's, okay, details about your speaking engagement are now in the chat for anybody. Thank else. you. <laughs> and, um, uh, Nick also asked about, uh, could a trackside trash cleanup be done? Uh, you know, it can be done because we do it all the time. The problem is, uh, as you might imagine, across 40 acres next to a shopping center, uh, trash quickly comes right back. So uh, we, we have a constant flow of corporate volunteers often who will go and and do trash pickups, but I know I know that it can pile up. But uh, it, it's a part of urban life here. On yeah, the we need the, the rail version of uh, Mr. Trash Wheel and uh, <laughs> yeah. Trash Wheel family. We need Mr. Trash Lawnmower or something. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to say thank you again to uh, all of our friends at Baltimore National Heritage Area. Um, this is a, a highlight of our year, uh, every year being able to present the It's More Than History lecture series. Um, and if you'd like to have some more Baltimore history, um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a roundtable discussion tonight at the Peel in person. Uh, about the exhibition Revolution in Our Lifetime, the Black Panther Party and Political Organizing in Baltimore, 1968 to 1974. And then tomorrow, so that starts at five o'clock. And then tomorrow we have an opening uh, reception for the exhibition Flowers by Ed Istwan. Both events are free. Uh, check our YouTube channel as well as our website uh, for a replay of this broadcast. That's uh, thepeel.org. And if you'd like to see more of this, um, please head over to the Baltimore National Heritage Area website, which is explorebaltimore.org, and you can make a donation and you will get to see many more of these in future, hopefully. 
Thank you again, John. It's awesome. I look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you, everybody who participated today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.